Good morning and welcome to today's online church service. As always, we're glad that you have joined us and pray that you'll be blessed as we spend this time together worshipping and praising our God. Let's be quiet for a moment as we open up in a word of prayer. And so, Lord Jesus Christ, we come before you today declaring that you are our Lord and our Saviour. You are the God who puts into motion all that contributes to life, not just on this earth or even in the solar system, but indeed in all the universe. You are a God of power and might. There is none like you. And we are so thankful, Lord, that we know you as our Saviour and our friend, a God who is near, a God who helps, a God who is genuinely interested in what it is that we are facing. And Lord, our response to all your goodness and your love to us is to give you praise and worship. And so, Lord, we ask that you would see our hearts as we come before you this morning, that you would see the desire for us to give you thanks as we pray, as we sing, and as we pay attention to your word. We pray, Lord, that today's service would put a smile on your face, but also, Lord, that we would be more deeply connected with you at the end of it, and more prepared to live for you in the days that come. We commit the service and ourselves to you now, Lord, and this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We now sing the song, Waymaker. comes from Nehemiah chapter 8. It's from verses 1 to 12. All the people came together as one in the square before the water gate. 
They told Ezra, the teacher of the law, to bring out the book of the law of Moses, which the law had commanded for Israel. So on the first day of the seventh month, Ezra the priest brought the law before the assembly, which was made up of men and women and all who were able to understand. He read it aloud from daybreak till noon as he faced the square before the water gate in the presence of the men, women and others who could understand and all the people listened attentively to the book of the law. Ezra, the teacher of the law, stood on a high wooden platform built for the occasion. Beside him, on his right, stood Matathia, Shema, Aniah, Uriah, Hilkiah, and Messiah. And on his left were Padiah, Mishael, Malkiah, Hashum, Hashbadana, Zechariah, and Meshulam. Ezra opened the book. All the people could see him because he was standing above them. And as he opened it, the people all stood up. Ezra praised the Lord, the great God, and all the people lifted up their hands and responded, Amen. Amen. Then they bowed down and worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. The Levites, Jeshua, Bani, Sherebiah, Jamin, Akub, Shabbatai, Hodiah, Messiah, Kalita, Azariah, Jozebad, Hanan, and Peliah, instructed the people in the law while the people were standing there. They read from the book of the law of God, making it clear and giving the meaning so that the people understood what was being read. Then Nehemiah the governor, Ezra the priest and teacher of the law, and the Levites who were instructing the people said to them all, This day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep, for all the people had been weeping as they listened to the words of the law. Nehemiah said, Go and enjoy choice food and sweet drinks. And send some to those who have nothing prepared. This day is holy to our Lord. Do not grieve, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. The Levites calmed all the people, saying, Be still, for this is a holy day. Do not grieve. Then all the people went away to eat and drink, to send portions of food and to celebrate with great joy, because they now understood the words that had been known to them. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God for his word. Now, our Old Testament reading today, set for us by the lectionary, contains a well-known phrase from Scripture, that the joy of the Lord is our strength. And I wonder if perhaps we've heard that verse, or sometimes even quoted that verse. I wonder if sometimes in just taking that one single verse out of context, we've missed what it really is about. And so today we dive deep into this wonderful chapter from the book of Nehemiah. We're going to begin to unpack it by looking at some background to the story. After the Babylonian exile, a remnant of Jews returned to their land. Under Ezra, who was their priest, their spiritual advisor, they rebuilt the temple. And under Nehemiah, they re-fortified the city of Jerusalem, rebuilt the city and rebuilt their homes. And when the walls were finished and the people returned to living in their homes, they were called together by Nehemiah to come and listen to the law of God. Here in our reading today, Ezra read the scriptures. And as the people heard the verses, as Levites, a family of priests, began to interpret what that meant for them, these people of Israel, who had been through so much, began to weep and to cry And to mourn. Now, many people believe that their weeping and their crying and their mourning was because they felt guilty. They realized how far they had fallen from the law of God, how much they had got wrong, how disobedient they were. Rashi, who was a famous 11th century Jewish writer and rabbi, he said that the people wept because they were confronted with how many ways they had failed to fulfill the laws of Torah. But I think that's perhaps just part of the reason for their crying, for their grieving. Think about how much they had been through in the last few weeks. They had traveled a long distance from a foreign land that was their home. They had arrived back to the land of their forefathers. They had heard all the stories about Israel and about Jerusalem. But when they got there, it lay in ruins. They had done the hard work of physically rebuilding the temple, the walls, their homes. They looked in the devastation and the rubble 
and try to make some kind of new life out of the difficult mess that they found. For weeks they had been vulnerable to attack from other tribes and other people who lived in the surrounding area. Jerusalem with no city walls was easy to be attacked, ransacked. Many people would have lost things, things would have been stolen, their lives would have been a threat. And think about how physically tired they must have been. Not just from traveling all that way, but from doing all that physically demanding work of building, rebuilding, clearing rubble, carrying bricks, making a city come alive again. And now you hear the word of God, and all it does is reminds you just how far away you are from where God wants you to be. How many ways you've got things wrong. How many beliefs need to be changed. How many attitudes that you have held on to all your life need to be completely transformed. And the people begin to wail. They are in a mess. They have so many problems that they are facing. Issues is all that they can see. There's problems with the place that they live in. Their spiritual lives, their families are tired and worn down. And the people are tired. They are empty. They are running emotionally dry. And so they cry and they grieve and they wail. Now the story may be from thousands of years ago, but I think there is lots in this story from the people of Jerusalem that we can relate to. Have you ever felt the way that they felt? Do you perhaps feel some of those things right now? Well, if you're in that position, then I believe this reading, this message, has something for you. The first point I want to make today is not just that joy is available, but that it is a choice that we all get to make. We are to choose joy. When the people start crying and wailing and grieving, Ezra and the priests, they tell them that they shouldn't weep, that they shouldn't be upset, that they shouldn't cry. They say that this day is holy and sacred to the Lord, that God has blessed them in so many ways over the last few weeks. It's not a day for tears, but rather a day for rejoicing. We read how in Nehemiah 8 verse 10, how they are told, to go and enjoy choice food and drinks, how they are to share what they have with those who have none, that they are to celebrate, that they are to feast. Ezra is telling them that this great day of celebration, this day of spiritual renewal, is not a chance to be sad or to feel guilty, but rather a chance to celebrate God and His goodness. No weeping, rather rejoicing. And what strikes me from this passage is that the Israelites are called to have joy despite the fact that they feel like weeping. It seems to indicate that in the Bible, joy is not just a feeling or an emotion, but rather it is an attitude and a choice that we hold on to. Maybe that is why joy is different from happiness. You know, many people confuse happiness with joy. We think that they are the same thing. You know, we feel happy when we get paid our salary at the end of a long January. We feel happy when we get to go on leave or go on holiday. We feel happy when good things happen to us. But the truth is that that is not joy. Because these happy feelings come and go. Happiness depends on on what we are facing, on what is happening. And sometimes happiness can very quickly turn into despair and disappointment. But joy, and especially joy as described in the Bible, is different. It is far deeper. It's not dependent on circumstances or happy occasions. Joy lasts, it prevails, no matter the circumstance, no matter the situation. Have you ever thought why so many scriptures tell us to rejoice even though times are tough? Peter says this in 1 Peter 1 verse 16. In all this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. Seems like a contradiction to rejoice in all kinds of trials. 
But Peter calls these persecuted, downtrodden believers to rejoice because they get to choose to do it. Despite their circumstances, they can have joy. Joy doesn't depend on what happens. Joy is far, far deeper. It stems from and is connected to a relationship with the one who is greater than all else. It is connected to the source of all joy, which is Jesus. Because Jesus is always with us. Because he never leaves us nor forsakes us. Because of what he has promised us for the future. For what he has done for us in the past. For the way he carries us and strengthens us in the present. We can be joyful come what may. And so Ezra and the priests call on the Israelites to be joyful. Even though they are feeling tired, run down, worn down, empty, perhaps even sad. They are told to choose joy. There's lots for us to learn that. Because we often don't feel happy. Often our circumstances are not particularly joyful. But we can still have joy when we choose to connect ourselves with God. He is the source of all joy, after all. The second point I want to make today is to highlight that phrase, of the Lord. In in Nehemiah 8, we hear that the joy of the Lord is our strength, of the Lord. It's a profound thing to realize, that our joy tanks may be limited. They may run dry, they may go empty. But the joy of the Lord is eternal, it is everlasting, it keeps on going. There is no limit to the joy that God can provide. It is a well that never runs dry. You know, if you're a parent, your strength is limited. But God, His strength is not limited. Your financial resources may be limited. There's only so much you can do. But the Lord's resources go on forever. He owns the cattle on a thousand hills. The wealth in every mine. We are here on earth for just a short space of time. Our health and our physical bodies will fade. Our physical strength is limited. But God is eternal. He is everlasting to everlasting. His life never comes to an end. His life is unlimited. And it is the same with His joy. His joy wells up continually. And I think that joy of the Lord is calling us to remember that in God... There is always a reason to rejoice. And God is the one who always supplies that joy to us. Henry Nowen said that joy is the experience of knowing that you are unconditionally loved. So no matter how difficult our situation is, how hard life seems to be right now, when we know and realize that we are loved by God, that joy can bubble up within us. It is a joy that comes from God. It is based on Him, not our circumstances. And so it is always there for you. There is never a time in your life, no matter how bad things get, where God's joy won't be enough for what you are facing. And then the third point I want to make is that in that famous verse that says, The joy of the Lord is my strength. There seems to be the suggestion that when we choose joy, And when we choose the joy that can only come from God, there is an increase in our strength, in our ability to persevere, in our ability to keep going. That increases when we choose to hold on to joy. The joy of the Lord is your strength. You know, that word for strength in Hebrew is sometimes also translated uh, a refuge. And so if joy is your choice, then it is able to give you strength to face all things. We are secure. We have refuge in joy because it protects us from the debilitating effects of pessimism and depression and discouragement. We are secure in the refuge of joy because it gives us strength to keep going, to keep on following God, to keep on connecting ourselves with Him and that well source of joy. When joy is our choice, it means that we are able to face up to our circumstances 
in the knowledge that God is with us, that God has done great things for us in the past, that God has plans for our future, that God is the one who is there helping us. And when we hold on to that joy, we find that we are stronger, more resilient, more able to keep pressing on and persevering. We have strength for all that life will throw at us. And so today I really want you to hold on to this profound truth that the joy of the Lord is your strength. And although you might not feel particularly joyful right now, you can choose joy when you choose to connect yourself with God. He is the source of all joy. And there are always reasons in God to be joyful. We can be joyful because of who God is. A loving Father who holds us and protects us and blesses us and provides for us. We can have joy because of what God has done in the past. In the past, He sent His Son to die for our sins, to open up heaven. We have a place in heaven because of what God has done. We have a record of all the help God has provided our families and ourselves in the past. And then we can be joyful when we look ahead to the future and imagine all that God will still do, all the promises that He is going to keep, all the help that He will still provide. And as we hold on to that joy, as we remember how good God is and what He is still going to do for us, we will find a strength within us, an increase in our resilience, so that we are able to get through all the darkness and muck that life throws at us. The joy of the Lord is your strength. What a profound promise to hold on to. And yet at the same time, I feel that there is a part of us that questions whether this is really true. Can I really be joyful? Can I choose joy? Do you know how bad my life is right now? I'm not sure joy is even on the table. But I want to say that joy is something we can get better at choosing. Something we can get better at practicing in our lives. To practice how to hold on to the joy of the Lord. It doesn't just come naturally to all of us. And in fact, there is lots in this world that will drag us away from the Lord and the joy that He offers. Lots that distracts us or keeps us busy. But if you keep going, if you get the hang of it, this kind of joy is powerful. It is contagious. And you can really infect yourself and others around you with the joy of God. So how do we practice joy? Well, in this story, in Nehemiah 8, they are commanded to feast and to celebrate and to acknowledge the holiness of that day of celebration with the Lord. Some good advice in there. If you want joy, then find reasons to celebrate. Have people over for meals. Celebrate events in your life. Attend places where people are celebrating and giving thanks to God. Because those are opportunities to express joy. They are great breaks from the difficulties and the hardness of life when we attend celebrations, when we find reasons to celebrate here on earth. So celebrate. Feast. Have fine drinks. You can interpret that how you want to. But God has given us a beautiful world to live in. He has given us people to share this life with. He gives us real moments to celebrate. Birthdays and baptisms and graduations and new starts and relationships and birthdays and anniversaries. There are plenty of opportunities to celebrate. We've got to choose to do it. So, celebrate, feast, make the most of the good that is in the world around you. The second thing to note is that there is joy to be found in the Lord. I believe that the most joyful people are those who have more of their lives connected to God than others. So find every excuse you can to connect your life with God. Daily reading of your Bible or following some devotional or something that you do that connects you with God. Worshipping in church on a Sunday. Singing praises to Him when you're driving in the car. Going for a walk during your lunch break so that you can pray and process the things of your day. The more of your life spent in connection with God, the more of His joy that you are going to feel. 
And then we remember that it is a choice to make. Sometimes the devil calls us away from God and therefore away from his joy. Sometimes it's by distraction and busyness, but sometimes it's by difficulties and real problems in this life. But in all those moments, we can still choose to turn our attention away from this world and what we are facing in our difficulties and cast our mind and our attention to God. To lay all our burdens on God, knowing that He cares for us. Choosing to worship God, to give thanks to Him, to express gratitude, despite the difficulties we are in. Because with God, there is always a reason for joy. There is always something to be thankful for. There is always some more of His love and His presence to experience that will help your joy increase and therefore help your strength increase so that you can face what it is you are going through. And so we have this nugget of wisdom from Nehemiah chapter 8. That the joy of the Lord is our strength. That when times are tough and we are tired, when we feel like we are on the very edge, well then we can remember to choose joy. To find joy not in happenings, that's happiness, but to find true joy in the Lord and to let that strength increase within us. So may you know the joy of God in your life this week. May you find reasons to celebrate and be joyful. May you choose joy. And may all these things increase your strength, your perseverance, your tenacity and your ability to keep going. Because your God is with you. Your God wants to help you. He loves you with an unending love. And he wants to see you live this life with the joy that only he can give. God bless Let us pray. And so, Lord, we realize that in you we have so much, including reasons for eternal joy. We are sorry, Lord, for all the times we miss it, all the times we are distracted and don't see it, all the times we focus in on the negatives, the problems, the issues, the worries in our lives. We pray, Lord, that you would help us to choose joy, to realize that happiness is fleeting, And is so connected to the things of this world. But your joy is different. It is eternal. Real joy, Lord, is not to be found in the things we experience here on earth. But rather in you and in connecting our lives to you. So we pray, Lord, that you would help us get that right. Help us to dig in. Help us to connect to your source of joy. As we celebrate. As we look for the good. As we spend time with you. And may that joy give us the strength we need to face all that comes our way in this life. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And so folks, we close off our service today by listening to this song. It's called, The Joy of the Lord is My Strength. It kind of summarizes perfectly what we've been speaking about today. Though the tears may fall, my song will rise, my song will rise to you. Though my heart may fail, my song will rise, my song will rise to you. While there's breath in my lungs, I will praise you, Lord. In the dead of night, I'll lift my eyes, I'll lift my eyes to you. Though the waters rise, I'll lift my eyes, I'll lift my eyes to you. While there's hope in this heart, I will praise you, Lord. The joy of the Lord is my strength.
Amen.